being able to engage with folks in person and have conversations and really be able to get, um, just share information together and be able to hold conversations. But now we have events like this where we're in remote locations, we can't really see each other or have personal conversations, but our goal is to still share information. And that is my newly acquired puppy. Her name is Quill. So tonight you're joining us for a webinar about earth-friendly landscaping. Uh, Gerilyn's gonna share some things about watershed health, and then David's going to really get into that landscaping aspect as well. Um, but both are going to be able to answer questions for us. So how you're going to interact with us tonight, um, all of your audio lines are muted, your camera, we cannot see you, and only our panelists will be able to really share video and speak. So if you have questions, please ask them throughout the webinar. If anything pops in your head, type it into the Q&A, circle down here at the bottom, and then if you're having any technical questions, feel free to chat those to me privately. So if you've never worked with a conservation district, something about us at Snohomish Conservation District, uh, we are non-regulatory. We work with landowners, uh, farmers, whether in your rural or urban areas, and we offer things like technical assistance, farm plans. We do a lot of outreach um, to try to engage folks in some of the programs we offer. And we do a lot of um, education at various schools too. And as we know that those things are just gonna be happening remotely from now on. Some of the upcoming webinars, um, the fall is gonna be filled with some of the webinars. So please look at our calendar events at our website. Um, we're gonna have some solar energy, renewable energy webinars along with some um, Streamside landowner workshops, and then another sustainable lawns and green gardening coming up in October. So another thing that you can do, and another event that's coming up that will be virtual is Orchid Recovery Day happening on October 17th. We want folks to really engage in orchid health and what that looks like, um, no matter where you live in the Puget Sound. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter today, uh, Gerilyn Ritzman. She is with Island County WSU, and she's, a, she's the coordinator for Camino Islands. Um, a little about Gerilyn is that she really helps lead environmental education programs that connect residents and businesses with science-based content on issues including shoreline stewardship, waste management, recreation, and sustainable landscaping. Along with managing the Shore Stewards program countywide, Gerilyn also helps facilitate two other environmental education programs offered by WSU Extension on Camino Island, which is WasteWise and Master Gardener. Our next presenter is our Community Conservation Program Manager at Snohomish Conservation Dis District, Michael, sorry, David Jackson, and he has been with us for a little more than a year now, which is pretty exciting um, and just really excited to have them both here. Um, and we took a little picture before time and just wanted to say thank you all for joining us. And from here, I'm going to pass it off to Gerilyn to start sharing and for her to get going on her presentation. All right, here we go. Sharing now. All right, thank you for the introduction, Sarah, and thanks everybody for joining tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about the benefits of earth friendly landscaping. Um, as Sarah said, I'm the Camino Island Coordinator for WSU Extension. So before I really jump in tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit more about WSU Extension in Island County. Uh, we act as kind of a bridge between the higher education slash research institution that is WSU and our statewide communities. Um, WSU Extension started in 1914, I want to say. And it was a way to bring the agricultural science and technology out of the university and share that with farming communities. 
Um, it started in Island County in 1917. And um, the scope has, from the list of programs that we offer here, you can see that the scope has really expanded um, from its original mission over 100 years ago. But what we do is we bring science-based educational materials through written products, uh, seminars, workshops. Uh, we also coordinate volunteer activities and other events and bring those to our communities. So um, the top three programs here that are bolded are the ones that I work with. We also have food systems, which is geared towards farmers. We have a regional forestry uh, coordinator who puts on a really great series of seminars and they've been going virtually during the summer. So there might be some more of those starting up if you have forested land and are interested in that. Um, and then the final three programs are more geared towards Woodby Island than they are Camino. Um, if you live on Camino, you kind of understand that sometimes we feel like we're a part of Snohomish County. Sometimes we feel like we'd be a, or, uh, Island County. And um, so some of our programs are kind of split up that way. So in addition to our programming, we have uh, several other resources. One is the Master Gardener Hotline. You can call the phone number that I have here to ask individual questions. Um, typically during summer, spring and summer months, our Master Gardener volunteers would be volunteering to do plant clinics at things like farmer's markets. But right now that's not possible, so instead we're doing a virtual Zoom-based plant clinic the first and third Saturday each month from two to three. So you can drop in and ask any questions of our volunteers then. Uh, we also have a lot of publications that we have access to and can share with you. And um, also, when in-person things are allowed, our master gardeners can do site visits where they can come out to your property and talk about like individual circumstances that you have on your property. So my main goal tonight is to talk about the why of earth-friendly landscaping. Why should we care about this? Like, why would we want to invest time and money and energy into changing practices on our property? Or if we're already doing those practices, what kind of benefits are being reaped um, by ourselves and by our ecosystems around us? So on a personal level, these practices, once established, can help save time and money due to lower maintenance and irrigation costs. And a well-executed landscape, earth-friendly or otherwise, can add an additional five to 15% of your property value. Now, outside of ourselves, um, it provides several services to the ecosystem. One is that it provides habitat for wildlife, food, shelter, a place to raise your young. And the two that I'm really gonna focus on tonight is that earth-friendly landscaping practices can help conserve water, and they also contribute to a healthy ecosystem and watershed. So starting with water conservation. The EPA estimates that one third of all residential use is used for landscape irrigation, totaling about 9 billion gallons per day in 2013. And of that, one half, so 4.5 billion gallons per day in the US is wasted due to inefficient irrigation practices um, from overwatering leading to runoff, evaporation, or just irrigation system issues in general, like um, using the wrong system in the wrong circumstance. And we all know that person who waters their sidewalk more than they do their lawn or garden. Um, the average family in the United States uses more water outdoors, with most of that going towards irrigation, than they do for showers and laundry combined. So during the summer months, we really see an increase in our water usage. And you can probably understand that pretty easily if you take a look at your water bills in the summer months compared to the winter. So despite our reputation here in Washington for our gray skies and rain that seemingly last months on end, Puget Sound actually receives significantly less rain than many other regions in the United States. And that's because of the type of rain matters. Uh, what some regions like in the South and Midwest might receive in one of their afternoon like summer thunderstorms, uh, we, it might take us several days with our dreary skies to accumulate that same amount. And this can be exacerbated by the rain shadow effect, effect that we have here in Puget Sound. Uh, so basically what happens is that the air coming off of the ocean 
it is forced up the mountain uh, to get over it. And as that happens, the, the pressure in the atmosphere and the temperature, they decrease and that leads to condensation, which eventually leads to precipitation. And then the leftover air finally comes over the top of the mountains and is much drier on the other side. So here, what that looks like is that we typically have winds that are blowing from the southwest. So the, uh, the area to the northeast, shown in the map here, that it, really, it receives less rainfall uh, per year than many other areas. And this can actually be a quite dramatic effect. Uh, there's a stretch along uh, Highway 101, if you're heading west from Port Angeles, where Port Angeles re receives um, about 26 inches per rain per year. And that in just 10 miles west of that, it jumps all the way to 56 inches per year. So that's an increase of 30 inches in just 10 miles. And then heading in another 27 miles west, it jumps all the way from 56 to 95 inches per year. So you can see in not that much distance, just the drastic increase in rainfall per year uh, for towns that are at relatively the same elevation. Now occasionally wind direction does change, so the rain shadow isn't always in this location. It could be further south in like Everett or so, but for the most part this is the approximate location. So depending on where you're joining us from tonight, uh, you could either benefit or suffer from this rain shadow depending on whether you like the rain or despise it as I do. Um, for, so for example, in Coopville, there is only about 18.66 inches per year. Um, a little further north than that is about 20. And then in Seattle, we have about twice the amount of uh, rain that Coopville does at 37.09. So you can see that once you get outside of that rain shadow, um, the rainfall increases dramatically. So from like a water availability and conservation aspect, the seasonality of our rainfall uh, means that the summer is a very critical period. From April through September, so six month period, half the year, we only receive about a quarter to a third of our annual rainfall. So our summers are very dry compared to our winters. And even though many regions in the U.S. Have, um, have more droughts than we do and more severe ones, we're no strangers to that. Um, since the year 2000, we've had five moderate droughts and two severe droughts, the most recent of which was in 2015. And you can see uh, in the chart to the right, that Island County and Snohomish County, the droughts pretty much line up there with it actually being a little bit worse in Snohomish. So regardless of whether you're in that rain shadow or not, um, our region can be impacted by droughts pretty equally. So next I'm going to talk about water sources, starting with Island County. Island County is known as what is um, called a sole source aquifer. And basically that is a designation that means that at least 50% of the drinking water comes from groundwater, from aquifers. And that is indeed the case here. Most of Island County, Camino Island and Whidbey, receive their drinking water from wells that tap into the aquifers, the exception being Oak Harbor and the Naval Base, which purchase their water from Anacortes, and that's piped down underneath Deception Pass. This designation also means that um, if our groundwater supply is contaminated, we don't really have a reasonable available alternative to that. Uh, growing up as a little girl in Camino, um, I once overheard a man say, well, if you poke too many holes in something, it's bound to sink. He wasn't happy with the development that was going on in the island. And so then every time I saw a house getting built, I would get nervous and be like, oh, geez, we're one house closer to sinking. Um, as I got a little bit older, I realized that we weren't really going to sink. But there is some truth to the fact that uh, more wells and more demand on the water supply can lead to some challenges. One of the main challenges here is saltwater intrusion. Uh, you can see in the chart to, or the graphic to the left um, that if there's too much of a drawdown from the wells, it can lead to salt water coming up through the fresh water and uh, contaminating the well. 
Typically, this isn't much of an issue because salt water has a higher density than fresh water, and so naturally it sits below the fresh water. However, as you get closer to the shoreline, where the elevation is lower, there's less height of the water table above the sea level, and the thickness of the water table itself is, um, is lower, and so there's a higher opportunity there for saltwater intrusion um, if there's too much of a demand on the water supply. So those areas are seen on the map um, in reds and orange and yellow. So you can see here that in our island environment surrounded by salt water, that um, those are the problem areas closer to shore. Um, there's a higher demand, as I said earlier, for water in the summer in an island county especially, that's when we also see the highest population uh, because of the snowbird community. And so we see a higher demand of water per household and then we also see a lot more households occupied, uh, leading to a much higher water demand. And this data uh, also, sh it shows that most wells that suffer from saltwater intrusion, they get worse in the summer and they start to improve in the winter and they get worse in the summer again. Uh, the only way to really recharge the aquifers through rainfall, um, between 20 and 34% of rainwater is available to recharge the aquifer. The rest is lost through surface water runoff, evaporation, or the water only makes it to the root level of the soil and gets taken up by plants. It's a little bit more complicated in Snohomish County. Um, there are some more rural areas where people use wells, but in the cities and more like developed residential areas. Uh, the water is piped from the Chaplin Reservoir um, and that's sent to Everett and then dispersed elsewhere. A while ago, as population increased and demand increased, they realized that the Chaplin Reservoir wasn't enough um, to hold all the water that was needed, so they continued the pipes up to the Spada Reservoir further east, and now they use a combination of the two to provide the water. Um, you know, with climate change, uh, with El Nino, La Nina, other factors like that, at least some years we can expect that we're going to have hotter summers, um, less snowpack from the winter, and that's going to decrease the amount of water available. And also we've seen a huge population increase in Snohomish County over the last few decades, leading to an overall greater demand. So next I'm going to talk about the healthy ecosystems and watersheds that benefit to earth-friendly landscaping. So we, when you think of watersheds, you can break it up at different levels. We can start by thinking of the whole Salish Sea as a giant watershed. We can think of the Puget Sound as a watershed. And then we can break it down to the river level. Now, these water resource inventory areas, they're not exactly a watershed at the river level. There's a little bit of a distinction where there can be some streams that are next to a river that they don't flow into the river, but they kind of flow into the sound adjacent to the river. And they're included in these rias, whereas they wouldn't be included in the true watershed. But for our purposes tonight, we can kind of consider these as watersheds at the river level. So depending on where you live, you can see what streams are near you and which river those streams would flow into. And eventually, like what the decisions on your property and the area that you travel in the most, like which area of the Puget Sound waters from that would flow into. And there are some areas like in Island County where we don't have rivers, but we do have streams. So the watershed can be broken down even further to the stream level. And here again, you can see based on where you live, which watershed you're in and which part of the sound, um, any pollutants or anything like that would be running off into. So why is this important? Well, because we've seen a huge population increase in the last 60 years or so. Of course, indigenous populations have been living here and living off the land for thousands of years. But the main changes to uh, land development and land use 
have come in the last 150 years or so since European settlers have arrived. And then especially in the last 60 years or so, or so as we've had this population boom. Now this data shows over 4 million people living in the region and that's just in the year 2000, so it's increased dramatically since then too. So all this development of our land has really altered the hydrologic cycle. Pre-development, you would see a lot of water infiltrating the soil, going down to the water table and creating healthy aquifers. Um, now, as there's more impervious surfaces, pavement, houses, etc., there isn't as much space for the water to infiltrate, meaning that the water table is reduced, our aquifer health is lessened, um, and there's more surface water runoff. And that also means that the level of pollutants in the water reaching our streams and rivers and the Puget Sound has increased as well. Um, when these pollutants can enter the ground uh, as soil infiltration, they typically will get filtered out through the soil before making it to the water table, but now that isn't the case as much. So as a shore stewards coordinator, my brain is always connecting things that we're doing on land back to our marine environment. Like what are we doing? How is it affecting the animals, the overall marine health, et cetera? So here in the Puget Sound, we have an incredibly incredible amount of diversity. Um, but everything's very interconnected and lives in a balance. So disrupting any part of that can really throw it off. So here in the Puget Sound, we have over 200 species of fish, over 100 species of birds, 26 different marine mammal species, over 7,000 types of invertebrates. And we also have a strong base of the food web with over 625 kinds of marine algae and hundreds of species of phytoplankton. And that's not even to mention like our food webs that are more terrestrial based. So tonight you've heard me talk a lot about the why, not so much the how, but there are a lot of different methods to practice earth-friendly landscaping and David will get into those a lot more. But we can retain water uh, and use it, instead of having it run off, we can use rain barrels. Um, proper irrigation methods are those that use less water for example, inserting a drip irrigation system where appropriate. Um, we can choose appropriate plants for this region, native or otherwise, just um, eco-adapted to the wet winters, the dry summers. Um, we can do lawn alternatives. If the only time you're ever on a stretch of lawn is to mow it, then you might think of putting something else there. Um, mulching will retain, will retain moisture in the soil so that less of it is evaporated. We can also do low impact development, for example, a pervious driveway so that water can infiltrate into the soil. And we can also use chemicals appropriately if you use them at all. So Dave is gonna get a lot more into these practices, but does anybody have any questions for me first? Thank you so much, Jaylen. We don't have any questions at this moment, but if folks just want to start typing questions when they're ready or anything pops to mind when David's presentation starts, then feel free to do it in the Q&A, and then I will ask those questions to you all. Thanks, Jaylen. Yep, no problem. All right, David's gonna get his screen share going and then we'll learn some of the finer details. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Gerilyn. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna talk about today, um, as Gerilyn mentioned, uh, I'm really gonna focus on native and sustainable landscaping. Um, a lot of the things that um, I get when I talk about this stuff is people say, you know, all that sounds great. Um, how do I do it? And the great news is, is that the conservation district is absolutely here to, um, there we go, um, to talk about how we do it. So if you're not familiar with the conservation district, we are a subgroup of the state government. Um, we 
serve uh, Snohomish County and Camino. Uh, we did a deal with Island County back in the day and uh, they agreed that um, we could have Camino and we were more than happy to take it. Um, so we work with, uh, so we also work on Camino Island. If you are curious as to whether or not we can come out, we certainly, uh, we can certainly try. If you have a specific question, we can also just help uh, get you the answers you need or point you to who you do need to know. We are 100% non-regulatory, meaning we are not going to get you in trouble um, for anything that you are doing on your property. Um, I mentioned that because we really want folks to call us and ask for help. Um, we don't want you to be worried that something you're doing isn't okay or that by us coming out, you might get in trouble for something. We just want you to ask for help. Um, I am part of the community conservation team um, that focuses on suburban, exurban, and sub-rural, um, as well as just urban. Um, that's basically anything that has to do with uh, plot sizes under about five acres. Uh, we usually come out and help. But all of our teams are really well integrated, so um, don't feel like you need to make sure that you're asking the right person. Just go ahead and ask somebody at the district. Um, you know, honestly, there's a good chance you're going to get Sarah, and Sarah knows everybody, and she'll figure out exactly where you need to go. So um, I want to talk about native gardening um, today. That's sort of going to be the major, the major crux of what I want to get through. Um, in all of the ways that we can reduce our inputs, um, one of the easiest is native gardening. Um, native plants are adapted to our, uh, our water cycle, um, our, our sort of seasonal wet dry periods. Um, this also goes for plants that are introduced, um, but not native. Uh, we call them native ours. Um, it's a blend of native and cultivars. Um, and they really do make absolutely beautiful landscapes. You can do incredible things with them. Um, and there's so much less maintenance because they're, they're sort of used to how things are done here. They don't take a lot of fertilizer. They don't take a lot of water. Um, native plants um, occur in this area naturally. Um, if you've ever just been hiking and said, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful, that could be your backyard. We can definitely help you with that. Um, and they, it's a very specific type of landscaping as well. Um, I have worked for a number of wonderful designers who specialize in this sort of aesthetic. Um, those designers cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, we don't, we are free to come out and we can get you the exact same look. So we're gonna talk about several types of native gardening. Um, Specifically, we'll be covering backyard habitats, native prairies, edible gardens, and then moss and clover lawns. Um, there are infinite types and subtypes of native gardens, and each garden is unique. So um, if you see one here that really speaks to you and you say, this is awesome, I want to know more, there are endless permutations of that type of yard, and they are all going to be lower input um, in terms of water fertilizer time effort um, and just just overall maintenance um, and they're all going to provide a number of benefits including conserving water so uh, backyard habitats um, this is the one that sarah is always most excited about uh, they are um, really colorful because they tend to have a lot of flowers for beer, for birds and bees um, they provide endless entertainment, um, especially in the spring and summer, because you get to uh, watch animals come in and use them. Um, you are doing two amazing things for your uh, local landscape. You are providing habitat patches, um, which allow uh, pollinators um, and other migratory species to get from these large areas of um, it, it allows them to cross um, highly urbanized or highly developed areas more easily. Um, you know, if you're in a big suburb um, and you've got two green belts on either side, you can be a really crucial kind of stopover point um, as, as animals are moving from one patch to another. And, you know, we certainly not, um, not uh, inconsequential either. You're helping nearby farms and other yards be way more productive. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that pollinators are a big part of productivity in plants. Um, and if you are uh, able to 
help pollinators get around, you are helping your local farmers and we love our local farmers. So pollinator habitats, um, they're, they're a number of, the, the idea is you want to provide food and shelter um, and just resources for pollinators. Um, aesthetically, this means lots of bright colors because you have lots of different flowers. Um, and then uh, it also means lots of different levels. Um, if you, uh, the bees that are there, because I always get this question, those are mason bees, they're not dangerous. Um, their houses look really funky. Um, they're really fun kind of accent pieces. You do want to keep them far away, um, not uh, in a place you pass by very often, um, not because the bees are dangerous, but because you don't want to disturb their activities. Um, but if you do get them there, uh, you get to watch them come in and out. Um, and Mason Bees building is just one of the most fun things, um, in my own humble opinion. Uh, this is not limited just to flowers. There are wonderful trees um, that support pollinators as well. Uh, big Lake maple, uh, uh, maple is a really common one around here. Flowering dogwood is another really common one around here. Um, willows, we have tons of willows. Crab apples um, are be flower, beautiful white flowers, white and pink flowers. Um, that poster is at that link below um, and I would be more than happy to distribute it. Um, I forgot that I put that poster up there. That was in my old office. Um, I moved offices and now I don't have that poster anymore. And Seeing it now, I think I may go in and steal it because um, I just love, I love how well it illustrates um, just how much beauty you can achieve, um, you know, in doing something so beneficial. Uh, bird habitats, um, this, if you want to talk about bird habitat, um, you do need to call the conservation district and talk to Sarah. She'll talk your ear off. Uh, this consists of trees and flowers. We know our Anna's hummingbirds around here. Um, they're, we, the, the feeders are great, flowers are also great. Um, if you have ponds, that'll support some birds. Um, my parents actually have a wonderful a deep koi pond um, that is frustratingly supporting a local blue heron who goes fishing in their pond. <laughs> um, you get to really enjoy migration seasons because they'll use your house for stopovers. Um, and as I mentioned, and as hummingbirds, which are sort of the, 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 the bird watcher's favorite around here, uh, besides the pillion woodpecker. Um, bats are also wonderful. I love these photos of bats because they show them as the little uh, sky puppy, uh, little brown fluffs that they are. Bats serve an incredibly important ecological purpose. Um, they eat tons of insects and invasive pests. Um, they, they're incredibly pro prolific. Um, almost all of the bats that are in the Pacific Northwest are endangered or at risk. So even something as simple as a bat box um, can house several bats and give them um, uh, room to, 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 to uh, live, but also to rear pups, which is a huge deal. Um, and it also um, will keep your yard uh, free of lots of pests, which I can't, if you have never seen um, a group of bats just tear into a mosquito swarm, it's, it's, a, it's incredible. Um, it's, it's really incredible. Um, one of the things you can do if you really love habitat is you can get habitat certified. Um, you can go to uh, the Wildlife Federation or the National Conservancy um, and you can um, apply for um, a certified backyard habitat. You get a cool little sign. Um, you need to um, make sure that you are providing food, water, shelter, and nursery, a place to rear young. And you also are committing to certain sustainable garden practices um, like reducing pesticides. Um, this is totally optional. Um, obviously everything that you do is great, um, but some folks really like the sign and it's a cool sign. So um, if you are interested in following this route, um, we can certainly help you uh, with getting your backyard certified. Uh, so moving on to water conservation. Um, so water conservation is a little bit different than just the normal native planting. Um, these are specific ways that um, you can uh, engage in water saving practices inside a native landscape uh, beyond just nor normal native planting. So the first thing is rain barrels. Um, rain barrels are easy. Rain barrels are cheap. Um, rain barrels just catch and store water. Um, it's, it, 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 it reduces how much you are um, actually watering. Um, 
in the really dry months, um, when you want your bushes feeling you know, really lush, um, or maybe you have an edible garden that you want to try to support, or maybe you have um, a non-native plant that you really love, you can draw on that water um, and use that in place of using um, municipal water, which is not only um, environmentally friendly, um, it also um, it saves you a ton of money. Uh, technically, if you are releasing water um, in an area, in, in a time that it is not normally raining, you're doing what's called a retiming. Um, that's not, it's not a very expansive way of retiming, and there's some of my hydrogeological engineer um, uh, counterparts who would be growling at me um, uh, for, for using that term because most of it gets taken up by the plants as soon as it reaches that shallow soil layer. Um, but it is, it is um, you know, putting water back into, um, into the system when it's not normally wet, um, which is a good thing to do. Um, rain barrels are very easy to maintain, very easy to hook up, and they're very inexpensive. Um, I, 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 I honestly can't think of a reason why um, a place wouldn't want to have at least a couple rain barrels. Um, a brief overlook in stormwater and GSI. This is, this is a big part of what we do as well. Uh, GSI stands for Green Stormwater Infrastructure. The most common version of this that you've, uh, you may have seen is uh, rain gardens and bioswales. Um, they are not, they're, 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 they're ways of essentially, they, their water conservation comes from the fact that they're putting water back in the ground. Um, instead of it going into a stormwater system, which will occasionally bypass waterways or bypass critical areas of waterways, they allow stormwater to re-infiltrate um, and go back to the water table. Um, which helps those summer critical low flow times. Um, they're particularly beautiful. Um, I could talk about them for hours and hours, but that's not what we're here to talk about. If you are interested in GSI or storm or, um, or rain gardens, please contact me. Um, I will talk your ear off. This is gonna sound um, really easy as far as a way to conserve water, um, but just don't water. Um, when you get to the summer, and it's time to water the lawn, just don't do it. Um, this phrase was made up by a, a friend of the district, be bold, go gold. Um, let your grass uh, you know, burn down to, to yellow, it'll come back, it's okay. Um, the plants that you know, look like they're struggling a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit hotter summer. Give them some water out of your rain barrel, you know, make sure that you know, they're, they're still alive, um, but don't worry about them. If you are, um, if, you are work, if you're working with native plants, they'll be okay. Um, if you are going to water, um, and hopefully using stored water, like we've been talking about, uh, water in the morning or late in the evening. Um, this is you know, either right after the sun comes up or right before the sun comes up. That'll allow the water to soak in um, and get down to the roots where it's most effective, rather than um, immediately evaporating. Um, if you are going to do this, also use some sort of micro irrigation. Um, you can use micro irrigation with captured water. Um, I would be happy to tell you more about kind of how that works. Um, it allows you to, to, to sort of make each gallon go as far as possible. Um, backyard prairies. So, this is an interesting one. Um, backyard prairies are um, really interesting landscapes that you don't see very often. If you want something that you know isn't sort of a, a big bushy thing, but you still want it to look really unique, backyard prairies have your back. Um, they're very colorful. They're usually pretty low growing, um, and it is unlikely that your neighbors are going to have anything like it. So native prairies in Washington have been reduced by almost nine percent. They are the most endangered landscape in the state, um, and they are there are several plant species that only only grow in prairies. Um, I am very fortunate that I've toured some of them. They are beautiful, beautiful landscapes, unlike anything else that you're going to find um, anywhere else in the state. Uh, and they are critically endangered. Um, and if we lose them, they are gone, um, and it will be heartbreaking. So the way that um, prairies work, part of the reason they're so they're so powerful, um, is that their roots just go incredibly deep, as you can see here. You have turf roots on the um, on the far left there. Prairie roots go deep, deep, deep. Um, they die back every year, and then the, the uh, above ground portion, the stalks and the, the stalk stems and flowers, um, come back every single year. 
um, but those reefs remain um, and they're constantly sequestering carbon. Um, they're just, yeah, they're remarkable. Um, so they're very unique landscapes. Um, they are a wonderful way to sequester carbon if you um, are, are, are into the environmental side of it. They're extremely low maintenance. Um, they're, they're just so incredibly hardy. Um, and they don't take a lot of water because again, they're adapted to this, to this climate cycle. Um, if you do this, big disclaimer, do not collect plants in the wild. Uh, there are certified uh, um, nurseries which will sell you plants. Uh, they are happy to sell you plants. They are also not particularly expensive. We will be happy to talk to you about how and where to get those plants. Do not go to prairies and try to dig anything up. Um, it is not only extremely illegal, it is terrible practice. Um, yeah, please don't. Uh, edible gardens. Uh, this is one that a lot of people asked about um, and we are more than happy to talk about. This is another big thing that community conservation team does. Um, this is another uh, set of lawn that can be, um, that does require a, a little bit more water, but it can be watered through captured water. In fact, it works extremely well using captured water for, uh, for, for this. And a lot of these plants are still natives and will not require nearly as much water as your lawn, and they will also handle the water better. Um, what, does that mean? what do I mean by handle the water better? I mean, they will store it in a way that doesn't uh, waste nearly as much water. Um, plus, they're just a lot of fun. So um, several different ways that you can do lawns for food. Um, you can do raised beds, food forests, um, companion planting. Food forests and companion planting, if you're not aware, um, sort of combining different foods, um, different plants that grow well together. Um, and then, um, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, and then um, uh, you can also do native foods. There are a lot of um, native types of food that grow here um, that are, again, adapted to this water cycle um, and are very, um, uh, very good at handling water and dry periods. Um, I do want to issue a warning is that this is not my area of expertise. Um, I primarily work on native plants and stormwater. Um, I have done urban ag and I'm more than happy to talk about it. I'm very enthusiastic about it. But this handsome fellow here, his name is Joe. Um, he is our urban agriculture coordinator. Um, if you call us up or email that email, you will get him. Um, and he will absolutely talk your ear off, answer all your questions, and help you get set up. Um, he is a, a wonderfully um, passionate person when it comes to this, um, and I strongly encourage anybody interested to reach out to him. Uh, so the alternatives to lawns that we talked about. Um, when I say alternatives to lawns, I mean things that look like lawns but aren't. They are significantly less work, they're less water, they provide other benefits, but they still look like lawns. First one is clover lawns. I actually just recently installed one of these. These things are interesting because you can basically just seed clover over your existing lawn. Clover lawns enrich the soils. Uh, clovers are nitrogen fixers, so they will make your soil um, more healthy and nutritious. So you can do clover lawns while you're getting ready to plant something else if you have bad soil. Um, clovers support pollinators. Um, they are usually one of the first things, along with dandelions, um, that bees eat when they um, start sort of foraging in the spring. They're extremely low input and low maintenance. Um, if you still really want to mow something, if you're just like, I got this push mower and it's my favorite type of workout, clover lawns got you covered. Uh, clover lawns um, will still allow you to, um, to, to mow, but will not be nearly as much water and they will not require the same kind of inputs. Um, these are really great for pets, um, it's, unless you are like my friend's dog um, who tries to eat bees, in which case um, I can't help you. Uh, that's something you're going to have to address on the dog side. Um, but they are soft. Um, they um, are, are just, they're, they're, they don't take nearly as much um, work to keep down. Um, they don't hide as much um, in ticks and things like that. Um, they really do work very well for pets. Uh, moss lawns are harder to do, um, even here in the wet, soggy Northwest. 
um, but they are very, very interesting. Um, they will not get tall. They are basically incapable of getting tall. Uh, moss is a non-vascular plant, meaning it doesn't really grow up. Um, it just sort of grows out. Um, the Northwest is very wet, but depending on where you're going, it may also be too sunny. Similarly, it's good for pets unless your pets like to dig at all, in which case they will rip up huge chunks of moss. Um, and of course, they're a beautiful, beautiful green. Um, a lot of people will call me and say, I have moss in this part of my lawn and I want to get rid of it. And I internally go, man, you called the wrong person. Um, I, I, I love moss. Um, I think that it, 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 depending on where it's going in, moss is a great alternative to grass. Moss is a great alternative to, to most stuff as far as the ground cover goes. If you have moss, leave it. Um, it's, I, I personally think it's beautiful and it's also doing some good work. Um, if you really want to get, <clears throat> I once had somebody who really desperately wanted um, a mossy rocks. And we're talking this house was like three years old, but they wanted a big oak tree, which we brought in for them and mossy rocks. This is before I was in the conservation district. And they were dead set on mossy rocks. And I found a recipe in which you can mix moss and some fertilizer and buttermilk and essentially put everything in a blender and then paint rocks um, and they got their mossy rocks their backyard smelled to high heaven for about a week but when it was done they had their mossy rocks um, so anybody who says that they're having issues with moss um, or if you do say i love my moss and i want it to colonize the rest of this area with moss there are ways um, some of them, I, I, will, I will probably advise you against the moss shake, um, but there are definitely ways to get moss to spread if you want it. So, um, <clears throat> great, you're sold, you're on board for all of this. Um, how do you create a native garden? Well, it's really easy. Um, there's four steps. First step is you create a plan. Um, you don't need to have any sort of artistic ability. It just needs to be enough so that you understand what you're seeing. Um, you can start by uh, sort of figuring out where the sun exposure is, um, figuring out what sort of soils you have. You just want to do some really basic um, kind of research on your own yard to figure out what may grow there. Um, you know, go online. Uh, Pinterest, I think, is still a thing. Um, and find all sorts of uh, photos for plants that you like. Um, there's a great website called Great Plant Picks that will help guide you um, on your uh, mission to find the perfect plants. Um, just kind of come up with you know, a general plan um, and know that the plan is gonna change. Um, hold it lightly and because um, you're gonna end up on version eight before you're done. Uh, the next step is to take up the sod. You can do this mechanically um, or physically if you really want to. Um, if you have a lawn, um, those lawns that are so uh, thirsty and take up so much water, um, and you don't feel like you want to go digging around and pulling stuff up, or you don't want to rent a sod cutter, um, man, uh, sheet mulching works really great. Uh, turf, turf lawn is a wimp, um, and you put down some cardboard um, you know, around July or August, um, and uh, that stuff will be that, that stuff will be pretty dead. Um, as uh, generally, we say you want to start doing that about two to three months before you start planting. Um, I really suggest planting maybe late September or early October um, when it's still a little warm, um, but the rains are kind of starting to set in. Um, that will give your plants the highest chance of success. So around maybe July or August, you want to start putting down, uh, you want to start putting those Amazon boxes to work and, uh, and start smothering out your lawn. You also want to find um, uh, wood chips so that you can put them down over the top of the sheet mulch. Um, you're going to cut the sheet mulch up and plant directly into the soil and then sort of put the, uh, the wood chips back. So the third step is amend and protect the soils. Um, that is where your, your uh, wood chips are going to come in. Um, you can buy wood chips. You can um, 
rent a chipper um, and bring down a tree. You can also uh, get um, wood chips delivered for free. Um, there are wonderful services, one of which um, I'm almost certain you've heard of called Chip Drop. Uh, that is a, um, a, very, a really great service. Um, once you kind of learn some tricks um, in, in, in how to ask for wood chips um, to get specifically what you're looking for. Uh, Chip Drop is an amazing service. Um, you just, you, you want to be a little bit specific when you ask for stuff. If you want uh, to talk about how we can help with that, please go ahead and give us a call. Um, we, we advise people on um, this kind of stuff all the time. And we'd be happy to walk through your plan. Similarly, if you, you know, want to come up with a plan or a rough idea for a plan and then give us a call, we would be happy, I would be happy uh, to sit down and go over your plan with you and give you um, some, some, some feedback um, or tell you uh, where to go for some of these resources. Um, that is a service that we are happy to provide. Um, and then the last step is to plant the plants. Um, as I said, you want to do it when it starts getting a little bit wet, but it's still kind of warm. Um, that will reduce the shock of the plants um, and give them the best opportunity to grow. Um, when plants are kind of dormant, that's a good time to do it. Um, so if you also want to try to plant in like February, um, or maybe very early March, um, when the plants are still dormant and it's still wet, that's another good time to do it. Um, we have a plant sale. Um, it's probably the cheapest place in the county to get plants. Um, it requires a little bit of planning beforehand. Um, it's always a big event. Um, if, you, uh, ha if you come up with a plan um, and put together a plant list, you could feasibly um, then jump on our pre-sale, order all of your plants. Uh, I believe, Sarah will correct me, I believe next year it's gonna be mid-March, as same that it was this year. Um, and then you could get all your plants and then rush home and get them all planted. Um, and that might be one of the cheapest ways that you can get this done. Um, the average, yeah, you can, you can do some, that, that, I guess maybe that is something that I should also note. Um, a lot of this stuff seems very expensive or very labor intensive, it doesn't have to be. Um, it can be very easy, um, very non-labor intensive and very inexpensive. Um, this, we have a lot of people who have worked very hard to make sure that this is accessible to everybody um, because this is, not, this is not aesthetic landscaping for the rich. This is sustainable landscaping that happens to look fantastic, that is perfectly catered to exactly how you want it to look, um, but it's also doing something beneficial for your environment. Um, and the conservation is the, the conservation district is committed to making that as inexpensive and as easy as possible for you. Um, we are a resource. Please use us. So speaking of resources, um, there are a number of books um, and places that you should talk to. The WSU Extension is not the least of which. Uh, NWF certified well, uh, certified wildlife habitat. I mentioned them before. Um, if you are looking for uh, stuff on pollinators, the Xerxes Society, you cannot go wrong. They have, um, I mean, I use their manuals. They're just the best. Um, they have lots of great information. Um, can't recommend them high enough. Um, Grow Your Own Native Landscape is a, call me for a free copy of this. This is a PDF. Um, when Sarah and I were in school together uh, back in the Stone Age, um, we, we were learning landscape, eco uh, restoration ecology and landscape ecology from Grow Your Own Native Landscape. That was our textbook. Um, it is put out by WSU. Um, you can find free PDFs all over the place online. Call me. If you, if you email me and just say, I want Grow Your Own Native Landscape or I want that book you didn't, you just kept talking about, I will just send you a free PDF copy of it. Um, it is, if you are going to do native landscaping in Washington state, or if you just want to learn more about native plants, or if you are like, I have discovered a new mission and I am going to start um, a native plant nursery in my backyard, this book can help you. It has so much information. Um, WSU really, really outdid themselves on it. Um, and in Western Washington rain gardens, if you are interested in rain gardens, um, this is the design handbook that even my engineer references. Um, it's done by uh, WSU, by the DOE. Um, it's phenomenal. 
Uh, strongly recommend it. If you're interested in rain gardens, give that a read, come talk to us, we'll be happy to talk to you. And then the Prairie Landowner Guide for Western Washington um, is uh, yet another WSU production. Um, I went to UW, but WSU really is the gold standard for this. Um, and if you really do decide that you want to, you want to be one of the few that says, yeah, I'm going to have a backyard prairie. Um, I want to be one of the ones that does it. Per the uh, Prairie Landowner Guide is going to have um, all kinds of information for you. Or if you're just interested in prairies. Um, I was out camping on a Gary Oak Prairie about a year ago. Um, and at night, I was just flipping through this to look at all the um, different things that I had just been walking through the day before. And it's phenomenally interesting. Um, it's just, it's really interesting reading. Really. Uh, so that is it for, uh, for me. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, my uh, phone number and um, email address are there. Please contact me with any questions. Um, we are more than happy. The, the Conservation District is a resource and we are more than happy to um, be of whatever service we can. Thanks, David. I really appreciate that. Um, one small correction is that the plant sale is going to be happening towards the end of February and pre-sale options are going to be open the beginning of January. So last year we had sold out on a ton of popular plants. And so if you're a part of the SCD plant sale email, you'll get that email about when that pre-sale date will be open. Um, it's going to be all online sales due to COVID-19, and we're just not going to be holding anything in person, but we will do what we did last year, which is bring your plants to your car that you ordered beforehand, and then either put them in your trunk or set them down and have you grab them. Um, so really open to those, and that will be open um, beginning of January. So we have, a, we have a question here, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, David, or not, but will clover or moss alternative lawns put down deep roots and hard soils with close to surface clay foundation? I have no luck keeping a lawn. Um, well, congratulations on having no luck keeping a lawn because um, getting because getting rid of lawn is, is, is one of the hardest, is, is maybe the hardest part. Um, moss will, uh, moss grows on any sort of surface. Um, the issue is, is it's similar to rock moss growing on rocks. It has a tendency to come up in clumps when it's disturbed. Um, so if you are looking for something that's going to be a little bit more permanent and you're going to be able to use, um, like actually walk over, um, moss might be a good, uh, a good aesthetic choice if you're going to leave it alone. Um, if you're going to try, if you have, if we, so we all have here in Washington State, we have the glacial till, we have terrible soils. Um, if you are going to try to enrich your soils into something that will um, you know, dig a little bit deeper, what I would actually suggest is um, disturbing some of the soil a little bit um, and then getting um, wood chip mulch and putting down over the top. What happens then is bugs, uh, it's a, a process called bioturbation. Bio, bio Sarah might, I think, Sarah, I, you're smirking like you know. This, <laughs> bioturbation, right? Right. Yeah, okay, bioturbation. Um, and what it means is a lot of bugs and stuff are going to come up from the subsoils um, and they're going to sort of help break some of that up. Um, similarly, when you do that, if you have a small amount of amended soils um, and you can plant plants, they will start breaking into that native plants. They will start breaking into that tough soil and breaking it up as well. As that happens and you develop a more nutrient rich uh, topsoil layer and um, rain begins to fall and follow the plant roots and get down into that soil um, and sort of sit in some of the clay and break some of that stuff up, the soil will eventually become more, more and more rich. Um, I, was, I was on a restoration site um, out on Mercer Island, Pioneer Park and it was standing in the middle of these enormous dug fir trees and was totally just enamored with it and found out um, as I was standing there that um, that had uh, maybe five years prior been a gravel parking lot. Um, and I asked them how they had fixed that, um, you know, just being a gravel parking lot and going to this beautiful dug fir forest. And it turns out that they had dumped wood chip mulch 
all over this incredibly hard packed dirt and then just pounded the bucket into the wood chip mulch until the ground kind of gave away a little bit. And then that, that wood chip mulch just kind of started to decompose um, and it just gave way to that beautiful forest. So with even with the toughest dirt, um, there's a way to kind of start that process of mixing it up and getting things going in there. Um, so yeah, I would suggest wood chip mulch to amend um, and then go ahead and just get some, um, go ahead and get some, uh, some, some, some plants with deeper roots and just plant them right in there and get the process started. Thanks, David. I just have two things to add to that, if you don't mind. Go for it. Yeah, so wood chips, great idea. Um, another thing to adjust first is that red clover does have some deeper roots and might be able to penetrate that clay soil. And secondly, it's just a huge misnomer. And moss, does, they do not have roots. No moss species actually has roots. And it's really crazy to think about. Um, because you do see those little fibers attached to different structures, whether it's rock or a log or anything else, um, they don't have roots. And so therefore they could practically live on anything, which is almost what we see, except for if it's lichen, because then it has its own like food producing power. Um, but great question. And the same individual um, also receives a lot of runoff Sorry, David, did you want to add to that? No, I wanted to jump down real quick because I'm, I'm looking at the questions as well. And it looks like the current topics, you have to remove the grass first. Um, I would not bother removing the grass. I would sheet mulch cardboard on top of it and then put wood chips on top of that. Um, the grass breaking down will actually help create some of your topsoil. Um, so yeah, I would, I would not remove the grass in that case. I would keep that biomass right on there and just let it decompose. Um, cardboard also decomposes, wood chip decomposes, so just put all of that on there and let it, let, let all of that become your topsoil. All right, Sarah, all, all, all yours. No, perfect, thank you. And yeah, just talking about um, runoff in the front yard that collects, doesn't drain well, probably doesn't drain well because you may have some clay soil and just water isn't able to infiltrate as well. Um, plants besides about planting other species to help absorb that water do you have any other recommendations david um yeah i drainage is a really hard one because i need to be out there um either so i would i would really suggest um contacting us and just setting up a site visit um we will come out and we will be happy to kind of assess your uh, assess your 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 problem or your opportunities um there on site um, it's really hard to do that even through photos um, or through a description. Um, all I can tell you is that we probably do have a solution. Um, our engineer, Derek Hahn, um, is extremely creative and he loves a challenge. So um, we have not come across a drainage issue. I think we've come across one drainage issue ever that I've seen him just walk away from um, and have, have to call somebody else. Almost everything else, um, we have a solution. Um, so yeah, please, please contact us and uh, make an appointment. Thank you. And then another person, um, not going to say any names, but asked in the chat, what are your tips for getting chip drops? Um, it can be difficult. I would say often, sorry, David, oftentimes folks have a better chance donating a little bit of money. Um, but if you honestly see any arborists, shredding trees, doing chips near your house, I would call that company. In my opinion, I, in my experience, I've had a success getting chip drops from Davey, um, from other folks who were just in my area and I called their office and said, hey, I want that load, can you bring it to my house? And they did. And it's just opportunities like that, but sorry, please. David. No, 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 it's, no, this, uh, this is taking me back. Um, no, so um, I, I know we mentioned it. Sarah and I went to school together. Uh, and so Sarah having the more right answer over the top of me in class um, is just taking me all the way back to college. Um, so, uh, so um, yes, the, the main thing for chip drop is you want to be careful about what you're getting and you want to make sure that, um, uh, that you are asking the right questions. Um, they chip drop or even just calling the arborist nearby um, saves them a ton of money. So 
you you are offering them and, and I, I say this from experience you you are you are basically cutting them a big deal um so being a little bit specific in what you want is perfectly acceptable uh, there it's very easy to think of yourself as like oh, i'm getting this for free you're saving them a lot of money as well so it's mutually beneficial don't be afraid to ask them questions the main questions you want to get are what kind of tree got brought down um what form is it in um, are you going to get leaves, branches? Are you going to get rounds? Um, maybe you want rounds. Uh, maybe you want branches. Um, I, I recently had a friend who had a whole bunch of out, dumped out there, and we turned the rounds into firewood, um, and we turned the branches into firewood, and all of that was great. Uh, I had so so, just 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 make sure that you know what you're getting. If you get something that's an invasive species, if you're getting laurel, if you're getting uh, uh, holly. If you're getting, those are the two sort of bad ones I can think of. Morning glory, English morning ivy, glory. field bindweed. Yes. Field bindweed, morning glory, same thing almost. Yeah, but no, but the, 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 the English ivy is, is a great one too, because a lot of times people will bring that down and they will just chip the ivy right on the branches without removing it. Um, so that's another great one to ask about. You know, if somebody says, oh, it's Doug Burr, be like, okay, what, you know, was there, was there English ivy left on? Was there morning glory left? English Ivy and Morning Glory, they're, they're like the Terminator. They can come back from nothing. Um, and it's once you get it in your yard, it's almost impossible to get rid of. Um, I worked on a house for a really long time that had uh, uh, a holly in one of their chip drop, drops, which, you know, that was, there was, the Arpers didn't do anything wrong. Um, the, 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 the homeowner didn't know what they were getting. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, there were they, they spent years taking holly starts out of their out of their yard. It's terrible. So yeah, so that's the main thing is just go ahead and ask ask what form it's in and ask what type of thing got brought down and ask if there was any problems, you know, uh, any invasive species wrapped up. Chip drop is a wonderful service. I'm certainly not trying to scare anybody off of it. Um, Arborist chips are um, phenomenal. They're, they're, they're a wonderful, wonderful resource. I agree, and, but there's that small chance where you can get something you just don't want and it's gonna cause problems. Um, maybe a problem you had before, maybe a problem you didn't have before. So it's, it's just worth investigating um, before they start dumping onto your property. And thank you also for saying that because it reminded me of something else. Um, ask how much they're going to dump. Mm -hmm. um, if they are thinking we're going to dump an entire chipper truck on you, that can be 12 yards um, and you may only need two um, <laughs> and you're suddenly going to have a massive pile of wood chips you have to deal with. Um, if they really are looking to dump a lot and they say, listen, we're not willing to dump unless we can dump everything, which again, that may be just sort of what they need to do. Uh, go talk to your neighbors and see if your neighbors need it anything. Go talk to the park down the street to see if they need anything. Go talk to your local pea patch or community garden. Community gardens always need wood chips. Um, so, you know, if you if you can say, yeah, whatever, we'll take, they're, they're going to drop 12, we only need 10, but we'll figure out what to do with the other two. Yeah, it might, it might still be worth it. Um, just make sure because I, yeah, I, that, that same friend gave me an earful when she couldn't get her car into the driveway for about four months after I suggested um, she get a, a full load dumped. She wasn't speaking to me for a little while. All right, so next question. Um, do we have a list of nurseries that carry prairie plants? And do we have a list of prairie plants? I'm gonna let you answer this, David, before I say anything. Um, uh, so the, the best list of prairie plants that, I, that prairie plants that I can give you would come from that uh, Western Washington Prairie Handowners Manual. Um, that's, that's not, it's not a comprehensive list, um, but it's a very in-depth list and has lots of information. I would say that'd be a great place to start. Uh, Northwest Meadows Caves, yes. Um, the, um, the, the, depending on where you are, a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of native nurseries will carry prairie plants they won't specifically note that they are prairie plants, but they will be plants that are perfectly perfectly comfortable in the prairie. Um, so you may need to do a little bit of searching for them. I know that there are nurseries in Washington that specialize in prairie plants, um, 
they are doing a wonder, an incredibly important service. They are also very expensive um, if you're going to go through them. Uh, and you, there are chances that at other nurseries uh, with just as high quality seed stock that aren't specifically catering to prairies, you may be able to find some of the plants for less expensive. Some of them you're not going, you're, you're not going to be able to. Um, my suggestion would be to kind of find, to, to, to go to a couple different nurseries and find where you can get some of the cheaper ones. And then for the ones that you can't find at other nurseries, have those be the ones that you go ahead and splurge on. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, David. Yeah, I just chatted that Northwest Meadowscapes, um, they have a great pollinator packet that we actually sell at our plant sale and you can buy it directly from them. It's the same price. We don't mark up stuff, um, but definitely a good resource and something I've certainly used and have good success with. And then I'm just trying to find the PDF um, for the prairie landscapes to chat you all real quick. But just wanted to see if there was any more questions. There was not. So I'm just going to write down some of these resources you all wanted just to make sure I can do a follow up email um, for folks who want that information. And I also chatted the link to the Western Washington Rain Gardens Handbook. And you can contact community conservation uh, team for any of these resources. We have most of them saved um, or just clarification on any of this stuff. Like I said, we're here to help um, and are more than happy to, to talk through whatever your plans are. Come to us with half-baked or unbaked or mostly baked ideas um, and we will nerd out with you uh, figuring out a way to get them done. Uh, thanks, David. I just want to call any last questions for Gerilyn or for David. Um, anything site-specific? Um, but if there's no more questions, I think we're going to sign off and then I will make this available on our YouTube channel for those who want to rewatch and get more information. Yeah, and folks who want more specific information, um, you can contact Gerilyn and David at their email addresses, which I will also chat real quick. But any last words, anyone? Right, and then I'm just going to get Jalen's email address. Or sorry, Jalen, if you don't mind typing your email address into the chat real quick. Folks can copy paste if they need. And then, sorry, I'm also just checking Facebook to see if there's any questions because we went live. Do not see anything question wise. Um, but yeah, any further questions can be directed to Gerilyn um, for WSU Island County and then David for Snohomish Conservation District, serving both Comedo Islands and Snohomish County. All right, well, thank you so much, Gerilyn and David, for your time tonight. I really appreciated it and such a wealth of information and really glad to just connect with everyone tonight. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Gerilyn. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.